Okay, um, everyone, I think the time is almost here. I um, only have about two minutes to start. So I, I guess I should probably um, just uh, make a few very brief announcements before uh, we start this session. Um, I was asked, uh, my name is Lei Fang. I'm, uh, I'm at uh, Texas A&M University. <clears throat> I, I will be the chair for the next two hours in this session. Um, just for all the speakers, uh, please be mindful of the time. I was asked by the organizers to stop you at 15 minutes so that uh, to make sure that uh, uh, everybody's on time and uh, the program can be uh, uh, run without delay. Okay, so I think our first speaker would be Professor Yi, uh, Young Ki Hong. Um, so Professor Hong, if you are here, um, feel uh, you could start sharing your slide so that we could get going. So Professor Hong um, is from University of Alabama. Um, he's gonna talk, uh, talk about computational material design for crystalline and non-crystalline materials. Um, so without further delay, I think we should get started. Professor Hong, please uh, take the floor and start. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Uh my name is Yen Ki Hong from uh, UC Department and Material Science PhD program from University of Alabama. Uh, everybody can see my PowerPoint slide? Yes. Can you see my PowerPoint slide? Yes. Yes. Okay, thank you. I will no problem. put on full screen here. Okay, uh, as you read my title, that's the uh, how to apply computational material science to uh, characterize the crystalline and nanocrystalline magnetic materials design. This is our uh, uh, College of Engineering campus at the University of Alabama. Right here, this is our department of ECE. Uh, now, uh, what we can do with the computational material science Today, I will present how to design hard and soft magnetic materials in a way of uh, solving the Schrodinger equation here, but very difficult. That's why this Schrodinger equation simplified to a Cohn-Shen equation, as you see here. Normally, magnetic materials will be characterized by hysteresis loop here. There are three key parameters to a uh, fundamentally uh, identify the uh, quality of hard and soft magnetic materials. They are number one, in this history loop, saturation magnetization. Number two, coercivity right here. And lastly, curie temperature of soft or hard magnetic materials. So uh, that uh, saturation magnetization, this is the, uh, uh, can be calculated by computational material science then means we calculate uh, magnet moment. So uh, saturation magnetization is proportional to magnet moment. Secondly, uh, this the uh, coercivity uh, uh, is, is uh, proportional to uh, unexial magnet crystalline and has to be constant to KU. Therefore, today I will be present how to calculate the saturation magnetization, MS, and the KU, magnetic crystalline, and I sub constant, and the Curie temperature. As I mentioned to you, uh, Consham uh, defined uh, the Consham Hamiltonian. That Hamiltonian include kinetic energy, lattice potential and electronic exchange interactions term here. So once you solve this, you can calculate the uh, saturation magnetization and uh, uh, form instead of magnetic moment, and the KU magnet crystal anisotropy. However, uh, permanent magnet figure of merit is the B times H. That means the, uh, we need a large H coercivity and this B from uh, MS, we need a large uh, saturation magnet as well. So everybody looking for high HC, high MS, otherwise high magnet moment and high KU. This is the uh, 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 process of what we have used in our laboratory to calculate saturation magnetization and uh, K value magnet. And that's to be 
uh, constant here and the Curie temperature. Uh, this is the MS calculation coming from a dense of a dense of a state such as the DOS. Once you calculate the DOS, which means the electronic structure of your magnetic materials, you can calculate the uh, uh, magnetization MS right here. Instead, how to calculate your magnetic anisotropy energy, otherwise the anisotropy constant. Uh, we can calculate by first the principal calculation total energy in the direction uh, in the direction of one zero zero right here, and another one is a zero zero one direction. Actually, this uh, out of spin, out of plane spin. This is in plane spin, and then take a difference uh, uh, between total energy. That delta E will give us the uh, total uh, magnet crystal energy, uh, magnet crystal energy, and then finally we can convert that number to uh, uh, NSTB constant of K. Lastly, uh, TC calculation. Uh, we can calculate total energy in ferrostate, ferromagnetic state, and the anti-ferromagnetic state to take a difference between uh, ferromagnetic state, which means the spin in parallel, and anti-ferromagnetic uh, uh, state, that means the anti-parallel. After that, so you can calculate the exchange integral Jij uh, by that formula. And then finally, uh, you can calculate molecular field parameter J0, summation of J0J. And then finally, you can calculate the Curie temperature in terms of a J0. And uh, uh, gamma, gamma is the spin factor here. So uh, theoretically, you can calculate uh, saturation magnetization and the K and the T sub C. That means so let's go back to here that saturation magnetization and the K and then QD temperature, we can theoretically predict it in given composition of magnetic materials. Next to uh, when we uh, add uh, some third element or foreign element into your original magnetic materials. Normally we are uh, concentrating on the interstitial, uh, 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 interstitial subst substitution. For example, in this case, in this case, the, uh, you can see, oops, this is the one of uh, a crystal structure to investigate for uh, electron density uh, map. The reason why we are uh, doing the electron density map because to that space will be available for additional alloying element or not. That does electron density map give us the idea if we can find the space right here or here or not. That electron map can be uh, constructed by that following a uh, uh, block diagram right here. So once again, we will solve the Consham equation. As I mentioned to you, Consham well defined their uh, Hamiltonian right here. And then we can have uh, two different zones. One is atomic sphere site. The other one is interstitial region right here, site. And then the atomic sphere, we can identify the atomic partial wave and also uh, interstitial region can define plane wave right here. And once we use the atomic partial waves for interstitial region, and uh, instead uh, inter uh, uh, atomic sphere site, and another one plane wave for, for interstitial region, we can calculate the uh, electron density as I see, uh, as I show here, right here. So 3D and the different plan, you can see that electron density, I will go or more details later on. So this is the electron density mapping uh, process. Next one is the once you're developing new alloy or uh, a new compound, the, we don't know uh, that uh, new compound phase stable or not. That's why we have to calculate the phase stability uh, to confirm our newly developing uh, composition will be stable or not. We will use the uh, first the principle calculation previously I presented it to you. So optimize lattice parameter from the first principle calculation I have shown you before, and then uh, total energy from first principle calculations, and then set 
uh, condition, uh, condition of calculation from first principle calculation looks like this. And the optimized lattice constant geometry looks like that. And then we will bring in MIT AV initial phase stability code, looks like that. And then we calculate the, uh, uh, just a minute. We, we calculate the uh, uh, energy stability to formation energy in terms of uh, ion concentration, for example, of manganese substitutionally uh, uh, substituted by uh, iron and then manganese aluminum. We identify that that uh, iron concentration give us the, the best phase stability of this compound. That's the way you can predict the chemical composition of permanent magnet uh, materials. Next, uh, so far I present all these magnetic properties at the zero Kelvin. Zero Kelvin value doesn't mean anything. Therefore, we have to calculate temperature dependence of uh, magnetization, which is called MT. Another one is a KT. We already calculated the previous to our slide uh, uh, QT temperature. And then we identify angular uh, quantum number J. And then you can calculate your uh, uh, MT curve using Brownian function. For example, right here, I, I'm giving you an uh, example uh, from the manganese bismuth permanent magnet. We calculate from previous slide, uh, 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 this QD temperature right here, and also previous uh, slide calculate zero Kelvin magnetization right here. Between this point and that point can be connected by this Brownian function. That's why this solid line Brownian function cover fitting here and the black, this dot, this is the experimental, experimental data. So our predicted solid line in good agreement with the result of uh, experimental data here. On the other hand, the KT, temperature dependence of magnet crystal anisotropy. We already uh, shown this QT te temperature of this compound, and we calculate zero Kelvin, et cetera, as magnetization. Between this and that point can be connected by a Kellen Kellen empirical relationship. Then we can have this one. So uh, you can see here elevated temperature, you can predict uh, for K and also uh, M. So this is the MT and the KT calculation methodology I presented. Next, uh, how to calculate your uh, soft magnetic materials. This day is the uh, nanocrystalline magnetic materials is emerging. That uh, structure looks like that yellow stuff. This is the nanocrystalline embedded and weakly ferromagnetic uh, uh, matrix right here. In our calculation, shows that we calculate the, uh, this crystalline and also uh, separately also uh, that weakly ferromagnetic matrix here. And then we can add up to have a final uh, saturation magnetization. Looks like this. This is the, uh, we developed this uh, methodology in uh, 2016. In that case, we have a separated calculate uh, crystallite magnetic moment and then matrix magnet month. Then we have added up and the BS is total in proportionally uh, calculated in terms of a volume right here. But this is to uh, uh, ignore interaction between crystallite and crystallite. Therefore, at 2019, we advanced this uh, 2016 methodology in a way of embedding this crystallite into uh, uh, amount force matrix here. Then we consider interaction between crystallite and also amount force matrix looks like this. And then uh, same way we calculate that. And then also what the stable state and the Curie temperature can be calculated by that methodology as you see here in block diagram here. This is the uh, our final density of state, otherwise electronic structure. This is a separately uh, calculate. This is crystallite, this is the armor force. We have added this one to that to finalize the total magnet moment for these the materials. But this is the advanced methodology uh, density of state. And in 
In table here, this is the advanced uh, methodology result. This is the uh, uh, a prior methodology uh, result here, but results almost the same as before. Therefore, advanced methodology is the uh, advanced, I want to say that. Now, next on hot magnetic materials. Uh, he, uh, hammer, which you are looking for four terabyte, uh, terabyte to be inch square density uh, uh, reconnect media because the connecting global billion of internet of things devices require more than 90 jettabyte. But one jettabyte means 10, 21 byte of information. That's why uh, recording industry, they are developing uh, new magnetic materials that the uh, nano site, nano crystallite, that uh, crystal size must be smaller than four nanometer and the well segregated from surrounding this magnet crystalline. They use the carbon as the uh, segregation materials. In our laboratory, we predict how much carbon concentration will be good for meeting all these required magnetic properties, such as the Curie greater than 9, 700 Kelvin saturation magnetization, uh, greater than 800 EMU cubic centimeter, magnet anisotropic constant must be five uh, megajoule per cubic meter, and then grain side smaller than four millimeter. So we predict what chemical, uh, what carbon concentration should be limited to value by uh, computational material science. This is the uh, uh, iron platinum, L10 ordered iron platinum crystal structure. And we wanna add uh, the carbon in a way of situating interstitial site right here. But we don't know what that space will be available, additional carbon atom or not. That's why we have done uh, 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 electron density map right here. So this is the before carbon adding electron density uh, map here and after adding carbon right here, adding right here uh, on the plan, 001 half plan, we have turned the color right here. Green means the last uh, uh, <clears throat> highly uh, uh, energy density, such as the electron Professor density. Hong, please be mind that we're running out of time. Okay, so uh, we, we have used to, uh, all this to uh, 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 computational methodology to predict your uh, chemical composition and magnetic properties. Therefore, here is the, my summary here, electron density map. I present to identify interstellar site for an element, theoretical development, the hard soft magnetic by first principle phase calculations and predict the temperature dependent magnetization, magnet crystalline as the constant in a way of uh, using brilliant function, kellen kellen and relation. I introduced the calculation methodology for nanocrystalline soft magnetic properties. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, due to the limit of time, uh, we'll probably have to save questions for, for later on um, poster session or during the break. Our next speaker is Dr. Pierre uh, Bernstein from uh, Normandy University. Uh, he's gonna tell us about the Magaliev transportation. Um, using superconductors. Yes, I am. Okay, I share my screen. Okay. Looks good. Can, Please can go you ahead. Yes, looks good. Okay. Please go ahead. Okay, so uh, I am Pierre Bernstein uh, with my colleagues, uh, Jack Nudem and Itang Zing who work on superconductors and nodinium iron borne magnets at Normandy University that is located in France. Today, I speak of maglev transportation. Since the 19th century, trains have been supported with wheels. Since a few decades, other techniques have been proposed. Essentially, electromagnetic levitation, electrodynamic levitation, and superconducting magnetic limitation. The common concept of these techniques is to support the train with magnetic forces. In this talk, I present them emphasizing the superconducting magnetic limitation. 
Electromagnetic levitation is a concept investigated first in Germany, but developed in China. The train levitation results from the magnetic attraction between electromagnets located, connected to the train here and ferromagnetic rays. The current in the electromagnet is controlled by magnetic sensors measuring the distance between the rail and the electromagnet. The guidance is achieved by the interaction of the rail with other electromagnets. This slide shows the location of the electromagnets here and here and details and uh, shows also a detailed picture of the support system. Um, and <coughs> an electromagnetic levitated train has been working between the Shanghai airport and city since, since 2004. Its commercial speed is above 400 km per hour. However, conventional trains can't run on EML tracks and vice versa. A special drawback of the system is the heavy and slow switches shown in the picture. The main effort for developing EML train is done in China where several lines are working in the most populated area of the country. This slide shows an EML prototype that reached 600 km per hour. I now present electrodynamic levitation. The use of EDL is planned for various hyperloop projects, but we'll focus on the Chuo Shinkansen that is the only project whose construction works are in progress. Much of the information given in this part is extracted from the talk given by Hiroyuki Osaki in 2017. This slide shows the limitation and the propulsion systems of the train. The train carries superconducting coils generating a five Tesla fields. When the train is running at a large enough velocity, this field it induce, induces currents in coils shaped as the number eight and located in the walls lateral to the track. The interaction of this coil with the coils in the train generates the limitation and the guidance force. For guidance purposes, opposite coils are connected. The propulsion is obtained with a linear motor whose stator coils are also located in the lateral walls of the tracks. In the lower part of this figure, we see a cryostat containing the superconducting coil. Above the cryostat, we have the cryocooler here. Here we see the principle of the cooling system and some specification of the coil. The cooling system requires two uh, types of cooling system, cooling, one with nitrogen, liquid nitrogen, so the one with liquid helium. Work is in progress in order to replace the low critical temperature niobium titanium coils by coils made with high critical temperature coated conductors that are cooled, that can be cooled at the temperature of liquid nitrogen. With respect to electromagnetic levitation, electrodynamic levitation presents the advantage of auto stabilization. However, the track construction is expensive. The trains roll on their wheels below 150 km per hour, and EDL suffers the same other drawbacks as the EML system, especially the heavy and slow switches. This slide shows the line under construction between Tokyo, Nagoya, and Osaka. Unfortunately, the construction is stalled for environmental reasons. We now detail the uh, superconducting magnetic levitation principles. In this video, 
you see the operator cooling down a superconductor above the central pole piece of a magnetic rail section. When the superconductor is below its critical temperature, it levitates above the pole piece and the levitation is stable. The first SML demonstration was achieved at the Jayotong University in 2002. The first vehicle prototype has been running on the demonstration track at the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro in 2014. The levitating system consists of superconductors in cryostats and rails including <coughs> magnets in the so-called Albar configuration. Here we see the levitating system. The Albar rail includes neodymium ion boron magnets and magnetic steel pieces in order to optimize the field and the field gradient of the rail. The cryostat here, made by the German company ATZ, contains liquid nitrogen and bulk rare earth barium copper superconductors. This slide shows the arrangement of the superconductors in the cryostat. In this slide, we see a prototype of a SML vehicle built in China. It could run at 620 km per hour. And, uh, but can carry the same cryostats as the Brazilian vehicle. The main drawback of the SML systems are the cost of the tracks and the, the unpredictable availability of the magnets. The main advantages are planar tracks and the possibility to build static switches as shown in the, by this model built in our world lab. The force of interaction between the magnet and the superconductor has two components, the levitation force and the guidance force. I say a few words on the measurements and the calculation of these forces. In the lab, for convenience, we generally measure the forces applied to the magnet. For measuring the levitation force, the, the superconductor is firstly cooled down at a distance ZCP from the magnet. Then the distance between the magnet and the superconductor is reduced down to Z min, where the motion of the magnet is reversed. Finally, the magnet superconductor distance increases to ZCP or above. The levitation force is recorded at each step of the measurement. For the guidance force measurements, the superconductor is cooled down at distance ZCP from the magnet, as before. After temperature stabilization, the superconductor magnet distance is reduced to Z. Then, the magnet is moved parallel to the superconductor surface to Y1, where the direction of motion is reversed, and distance Y decreases down to Y2, before increasing to Y equal to zero the guidance force is measured at each step of the measurement. When a superconductor is cooled down in the field of a magnet above the critical temperature, the field goes through the superconductor. Below the critical temperature, the magnetic flux is canalized along flux, line, flux tubes called vortices. If the separation between the superconductor and the magnet changes, so does the vortex distribution. As a consequence, shielding currents flow in the superconductor, generating a magnetic moment. The interaction of these currents with the, the applied field is responsible for the, for the levitation and the guidance forces. If there is a lateral motion of the magnet with respect to the superconductor, the vortex distribution, the shielding currents, and the, the associated magnetic moment change. The levitation and guidance forces can be calculated with numerical simulation. One generally combines the finite elements method and the Maxwell equation. 
superconductivity is accounted for by the so-called power law. The calculation results in the determination of the current density of the current density everywhere in the superconductor and as a result of the force of interaction between the superconductor and the magnet. This is sorry. Not better. What happens? The limitation and guidance forces can also be calculated with analytical models. We'll give a few insights on the mean fin model developed in a war lab. The magnetic moment due to the shielding currents flowing in the superconducting disk can be written with an expression proposed by Elwood Brand. We'll use the Brandt expression, replacing in thickness H by that of the layer carrying the, carrying the superconducting current, E, and field B by field delta B, that is a field accounting for the difference between the mean value on T of the field applied during field cooling and that applied during the measurements. The force of interaction between the magnet and the superconductor can be written as the force applied to a magnetic moment here in an in a, a non-uniform magnetic field. The limitation and guidance forces being respectively the vertical and the uh, lateral component of this force. They will be calculated with the mean value and fitness T of the gradient of the vertical component of field delta B. This slide shows the levitation force cycles measured on the NGB2 sample cooled down in the, in the field of an iridium magnet at two different temperatures and two different cooling distances. At each temperature, for the force cycles measured at the different cooling distances can be reproduced introducing the same GC and T values in the calculation. Here we see the guidance force applied to an MGB2 superconductor. The slope of the guidance force is negative. Uh, this shows that levitation is stable. The measurements are correctly reproduced with the, by the calculation shown as the blue line. Here the slope of the guidance force is positive near the region and levitation is unstable. Instability is also shown by the calculation. This slide shows the mean value here of the magnet field in the superconductor as a function of their separation for various Z values. The model permits to determine such stable and unstable regions. As conclusions, maglev transportation is already a reality. With respect to electromagnetic levitation and electrodynamic levitation, superconducting magnetic levitation presents the advantages of planar tracks and possible static switches. Improvement are required for SML to benefit from these advantages. Concerning the materials, it's mainly improving the availability and lowering the cost of neonidium iron boron magnets, or developing new magnets with high coercivity and remanent magnetization containing materials cheaper and more available. Thank you for your attention. Okay, I'm finished. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Pierre Bernstein. Um, um, we're right on the mark of the time limit. <laughs> So thank you for keeping that. Um, uh, we'll probably have to uh, save questions uh, for, for the break or for the poster session. Um, our next speaker is um, Dr. Let's see. Our next speaker is Dr. Just Adam.
from University of Southern Denmark. He's going to tell us about computational design and optimization of plasmodic materials and nanostructures. Hi, thank you very much for the kind introduction. I think I need to wait to share the screen for uh, Pierre to stop it. Uh, yes, I, I tried to do it. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I stopped. Okay, it's good. It's good. Excuse me. Sorry. It's good. Yeah. Okay, I think now it works. Yeah. Okay, I hope you can see this. Yes, we can see it. Okay, so thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, for the nice introduction. And I would like to take, take the opportunity to thank the organizers for inviting me to this talk. Um, my name is Joost Adam. I'm an associate professor at the University of Southern Denmark, where I lead the computational materials group. And um, we are located actually in, at this very nice little town Sönderbo in the south of uh, Denmark here at the Baltic Sea. Um, I'd like to spend a word on why I would like to talk about plasmonics actually. And I, I usually um, like to show this very nice graphic from Brongersma and Shalaev depicting critical device dimensions against uh, operating speed of current devices. And there's um, the past also indicated by this very old telephone here with um, device dimensions larger than one micron and speeds below the gigahertz regime. And then if you get um, faster in operating speed, then this region beyond one micron is covered by dielectric photonics. Um, whereas when you go, let's say lower in the critical device dimensions, this is then you are in the regime of, of actual semiconductor electronics. And the beauty of metallic nanoplasmonics is that it covers basically both uh, high speed and low critical device dimensions. And that's why it's still very uh, desirable to design materials and structures fostering these uh, physics. So, what do we have to do to model this? We are proposing here a combination of molecular to mesoscale modeling. So when the um, structures are in, in the order of uh, the wavelength, we can model our systems by classical Maxwell's equations. We can use analytical methods, rigorous semi-analytical methods, discretization methods, depending on the complexity of our structures. So how do we get the uh, optical uh, material behavior into these uh, simulations? We usually used electric permittivity epsilon, a complex value classically designed by the Drew model. And um, here we basically only take into account the intraband transitions. So the low energy regime. So you can see that at this um, curve here, the blue curve on the right side, depicts uh, total losses of a real world material. And the Drew term only represents this nicely in the higher wavelength or lower energy regime. Whereas here in the higher energy regime, we have interband transitions to be taken into account. And we usually do that by adding further Lorentz terms, more to that a little bit later. So <clears throat> now I want to uh, describe the um, general procedure we are um, proposing here, we start with atomic scale simulations, um, DFT, ab initio simulations. From there on, we dis extract dispersive permittivity values and then verify these systems, either against um, experimental results, if, if we have any, or by, let's say, looking at the relaxed structure and looking at phonon and ener energy considerations. From there on, with a reliable system, we can extract the optical parameters. <clears throat> um, by Drude Lorentz uh, models, for instance, or the uh, dispersion curves gathered already here. And then we feed this into the modeling, uh, into the electromagnetic modeling to look at meter materials, waveguides, plasmonic particles, and so on and so forth. And therefore, we can introduce a life cycle for, let's say, digital or numerical testing of materials. So uh, a very quick word, because we had a very, very nice introduction already in the first talk in this session about DFT. So the first stage is DFT, which numerically solves quantum mechanical systems by Schrödinger's equation. And as depicted before, um, the full Hamiltonian here for a many body, from a many pers body perspective is very cumbersome to solve for. So DFT approximations are 
the cone charm equation we heard about earlier together with an effective potential v effective so we get from a many body perspective to an electron density perspective making it possible to uh, calculate these materials more effectively so once we have a relaxed structure we can extract various material parameters we heard about um, magnetic materials earlier, but we can, in principle, ele uh, exclude, um, extract electronic properties, electrical ones, optical ones, and elastic properties. So we can really look at multi-physical um, characteristics of these created materials. Today, I was uh, will focus on optical parameters. So once we have the ground stage energy system, we extract the electronic uh, properties, energy band structure, and um, density of states. And from there on, we would extract the optical properties with an emphasis on the contribution of interband transitions because we need these higher energy contributions for plasmonics. Today, I want to introduce three examples uh, of alternative plasmonic materials, alternative to classical gold and um, silver. And the first one uh, group I wanted to mention are the transparent conducting oxides. So we worked on aluminum doped ZNO, so AZO. The second one is an uh, intermetallics member, zirconium nitride, which is very close in its um, um, properties to, to gold and, and therefore is a very interesting material. And then I want to talk about um, silicon allotropes and nanostructures. We worked on um, silicon nanowire plasmonics in this third article I want to discuss today. So let's start with the aluminum doped zinc oxide. Um, so we use this uh, hexagonal wurzite structure from ZNO and then exchange uh, zinc atoms by aluminum atoms. And depending on the size of our supercell here, we get to a certain amount of uh, atomistic percent of aluminum in the uh, wurzite structure of ZNO. And um, the problem is that DFT, um, we use the siesta package here, that DFT usually underestimates the band gap of these semiconductors. Uh, so what we propose is to use this so-called Hubbard correction. And this makes up for this, as you will see in, uh, in a second. So for instance, if we start with the ZNO semiconductor, it the classical um, code pro um, predicts a uh, gap of a band gap of 0 0.9 electron volts and applying these Hubbard correction uh, discussed before creates a um, band gap of 3.1 electron volts. And this is much, much closer, much more in line with the experimental results um, available for ZNO. Then from there on, we look at the first doping concentration, this atomic percent uh, scenario, even more electrons are accumulated around the Fermi energy, and this creates even more enhanced metallic behavior. So what happens if we extract the optical parameters now? So we extract the, the complex um, electric permittivity. As I said already, uh, the absorption edge is around 0 0.9. If we don't apply the Hubbard correction, with Hubbard correction, we have 3.1 electron volts, and you can see here, um, that this is much more in line with the available um, experimental results. Then when we start doping, um, the absorption edge shifts blue to four electron volts. And again, here we uh, depicted the result also without the Hubbard correction, which is completely off regarding the absorption edge. And the other one is very much in line with the results available for, um, experimentally, only of course up to around four electron volts. If we go then to the um, six atomic percent uh, variant, we um, don't uh, have any experimental results anymore, but we consider our model verified by the previous two cases. And then we can predict that the absorption edge further shifts to 4.5 electron volts. So now as a second step, if we have this extracted parameters, we, uh, we tested this in a split ring resonator meter material uh, scenario where you have these metallic U-shapes arranged in periodic lattices on the surface. And you can um, excite these structures in an X, X and Y polarized way. And then you will excite magnetic resonances or electric, uh, electric resonances, aka plasmonic modes uh, respectively. And you see that here, the AZ06 model with six atomic percent of aluminum is much, much more pronounced in terms of these resonances. So a very much enhanced 
behavior. So this was our proposal for the future AZO doping concentration. And then we moved on to zirconium nitride. Our second example, we followed the same procedure as it introduced before, just with an LDA uh, potential and not with Hubbard correction because it's not a semiconductor. We looked again at the density of states and we extracted the um, complex uh, electric permittivity. And again, we were very much in line with recent um, experimental results up to around four electron volts. And then by introducing the interband transitions for higher order or higher, um, higher energies, we can also predict this up to eight electron volts and even further up. Looking at these uh, split ring resonators, also in this case, we see that it exhibits very nice plasmonic modes and very nice uh, magnetic LC1 and LC0 modes. Um, in this case, you see that they are much shifted uh, to the visible regime. And this is exactly where you also would expect um, these split, split ring resonators made of gold. To investigate a little bit further the comparison to, let's say, the gold standard gold, uh, we would uh, compare the now particle scattering or particle plasmonics from uh, gold spheres to ZRN spheres. And uh, the dispersive graphics here for scattering and absorption characteristics show um, nicely that ZN, ZRN is very, very close to gold. It's just a little bit, um, let, let's say, less, less sharp in its resonances. We looked at the same uh, material in a classic Kretschmann configuration um, surface plasma pol polariton um, situ scenario. And here you see that again for gold thin films, uh, you have very sharp resonances, this Kretschmann angle moves, so this can be nicely used for sensing purposes. And if you look at ZRN, then it's a little bit less pronounced, of course, these, um, these uh, resonances here are a little bit shallower, let's put it this way, but they follow very nicely the same trend, the same sensitivity. So you could use this material also very nicely for sensing. You're, of course, sacrificing a little bit this sharpness, very desirable in sensing, but on the other hand, it's much more stable in terms of mechanical stability and thermal stability. So it's a valid alternative to the abundant material gold. Um, the silicon um, plasmons in uh, na silicon nanowires, we tackled together with our partners at CNR IMN in, in Catania, and they were able to make this awesome, not only fabrication, but also eels characterization of 30 nanometer wide silicon nanowires. What we contributed is we DFT calculated the optical parameters for 111 bulk silicon 111 because it resembles the growth direction of these nanofibers. And uh, we were able to confirm by FEM modeling con uh, in, in afterwards the surface plasmons. So when you look at the extracted um, relative electric permittivities here, you see that the, the real part of the electric permittivity goes negative for a four, roughly four electron volts and beyond. So that is where you would classically um, expect plasmonic effects to happen. And if you look at these wonderful eels maps here, um, where <clears throat> you have the uh, electromagnetic loss on the surface or in, inside these nanowires, you see that uh, we have a combination of traveling plasmons um, confined by the resonator uh, introduced by the length of the nether wire. And then we also have transverse modes which resemble very much the, let's say, localized plasmons you have also in particles where no traveling is happening. And we were able with our material models and full 3D FEM simulations to very nicely verify the experimental findings in this work. I want to highlight Another um, topic we are working on together with our partners at CSC Nanogune in San Sebastian, Spain, where we have self-assembled na gold nanoparticles on surfaces. So we have, let's say, nanostructures self-assembled from colloidal particles, and they are arranged in larger scale lattices. So you have a combination of plasmonic local fields effects and the grating effects introduced by the periodicity. And we optimize these structures by looking at the single um, particles, comparing to mead theory, optimizing uh, parameters like particle size, materials, shell thickness, and so on and so forth. And then we analyzed the SEM images by uh, statistical image processing. 
And then the combination of this optimized material and the knowledge about statistically how these clusters look like led to a very nice support of the experimental findings. And uh, we could verify the enhanced surface uh, uh, surface enhanced Raman scattering performance of these devices. I would very much like to introduce to you um, pro a project that my group is working on now for quite some time. It's the Photonic Materials Cloud. It's a fully interactive online tool for creating, comparing, and testing optical materials. It's a high-performance computing-backed online calculator for particle thin film optical response. So you can basically create your own materials by Drew Lawrence materials. You can take the uh, material from the database, the refractive index.info um, uh, database, you can upload your experimental files and then create and compare materials, calculate particle scattering, thin film responses, and export publication ready graphics and export your data. So it's all free and HPC backed. And uh, please visit photonicsmaterials.info. Um, summing up, I showed you some alternative plasmonic materials and approach to molecular to mesoscopic modeling. Uh, I motivate very briefly data analysis and optimization for, let's say, optimized support of experimental work. And I would, you know, a very dear project to me is the Photonic Materials Cloud. I just very briefly introduced to you. I want to thank my team, the Computational Materials Group, and my partners at, at um, IMM, UniME, and uh, the Nanogune Biomagune um, in Spain. And I would like to thank my uh, financing from the European uh, Union. If you want to learn more about the group, then please visit the group homepage. And if you want to uh, integrate uh, the photonic materials calculator into your uh, research line, then please visit photonicmaterials.info. Thank you very much. Great. Uh, let's all thank uh, Professor Adam. Um, to keep the program moving on, uh, we will need to go to the next speaker now. Um, it will be uh, Dr. Jacob Critch from University of Ottawa. He's going to tell us about mismatched alloy for mid-IR plasmonics. The floor is yours, uh, Dr. Creech. Great, thank you. Um, I hope everybody can hear me. Uh, so uh, it, it's a pleasure to be here. I'd like to thank the organizers for the invitation um, and uh, also for putting me in the perfect position after that great talk by Yost. It's too bad I have a bunch of questions. Um, I feel like I should give my time to ask them, but I'll, I'll, I'll continue with my talk instead. Um, so what I'm gonna be doing is uh, talking about plasmonics and new materials for it, but in a completely different energetic range than what he was just speaking about. So, and also something that's uh, considerably less mature in its development. So this is work uh, along with my talented postdoc, Hassan Alami, um, at uh, the University of Ottawa. It's, we're a theoretical group, but not ab initio. So we'll be talking from the phenomenological side. Um, so we've already had a nice introduction to plasmonics, but what I'm gonna be talking about right now is not the plasmonics in the um, several EV range, but instead, things that are active in the mid IR range. So um, we've had a very nice overview of what plasmonics um, uh, can do, but we can also in the mid IR range harness these plasmonic properties to give uh, very localized sensors that allow us to fingerprint molecules who have vibrations um, that, are, that are in this mid IR range. There's also an interest for lasers and metamaterials. And um, I have here on, on, on the right, I mean, it, it's hard for me to find a, a good graphic for this, but mid IR um, plasmonic materials are dominantly doped semiconductors. Plasmonics is a, is a study of metals um, and the, the plasma oscillations of the electrons in a metal. But if you dope a semiconductor, then inside of one of its bands, you effectively have a, a metal if you just look at that band. And so you can end up with plasma oscillations that are considerably lower frequency than you get for standard metals like gold. So over here, we can see that we have, I'm, I'm not really interested in the quality factor for, for at this point, but just the, the energetic range um, on the on the upper scale wavelength on the bottom scale for a range of materials gallium nitride silicon carbide a bunch of doped silicon they're out here in the 250 going out to 100 uh, milli electron volt range and what i want to talk about is a new material class that can give us tunable plasmonic resonances out in this uh, longer wavelength regime which is the highly mismatched alloy Okay, so what's a highly mismatched alloy? Uh, it's mostly a 3.5 or 2.6 
uh, semiconductor, but it's one where when we're alloying elements, we put in an element that is very different from one of the base uh, semiconductor elements. So for example, if you take the classic case is gallium arsen arsenide, where you replace some of the arsenic with nitrogen. The strong electronegativity difference between arsenic and nitrogen means that, that the band, band gap of that material cannot be well described with a standard interpolation and bowing factor as we get in uh, standard alloys. So instead it's called a highly mismatched alloy. And uh, these have been used, a couple examples of the early ones I put on the right, um, they've been used for uh, making laser diodes and for solar cells because it produces this very large tunability, but now there's a large study of this class of highly mismatched alloys, but nobody has previously talked about their plasmonic properties. So what I wanna talk about is uh, what we can do with a highly mismatched alloy for plasmonics. So in order to do that, we need a model to describe the band structure. So that the simplest model, which has been remarkably effective, as I'll show you in a moment, for describing the band structure of a highly mismatched alloy is the band anti-crossing model. And what it does is it says that we start out with some semiconductor, in this case, we just have a parabolic conduction band and some valence bands, and we put in um, some alloying elements. So in this case, this could be nitrogen inside gallium arsenide. It has some defect energy. It's a localized state. So we consider it spread out in K space. And the band anti-crossing model says that at each of these uh, K points independently, we have an avoided crossing between the conduction band state and the defect energy. And all of those um, are coupled with the same coupling constant, V and the square root of X, where X is the alloy fraction. So that means that we have only two parameters for this model. We have the defect energy relative to the zero point is the bottom of the conduction band in the original structure and this V. And so when we put in that, that coupling, then we get the, the splitting of these original conduction and defect bands into two new bands called the E minus and the E plus bands. Now, the thing that people have been most interested in is the band gap from the valence band up to the E minus band. Okay, that's been the most important concept um, inside this field. And that band gap has been very well described by this band anti-crossing model. So this is for gallium arsenide nitride. So this is the arsenic fraction on the, on the horizontal axis. So the uh, dilute nitrogen side is right over here on these points. So these are experimental data with fits to this two parameter band anti-crossing model. Um, in black, this inset shows that in this region, it fits extremely well, whereas a simple Boeing parameter model just cannot fit it well. That's this green curve, and it certainly doesn't do well to go both sides, whereas the band anti-crossing model does very well both in the dilute arsenic and in the dilute nitrogen side of this, um, of, of this structure. Okay, so the band anti-crossing model gives good description of the energetics. We need to do a little bit more if we want to talk about plasmonics. We need to be able to know about how the electrons propagate. So the, the, the language I want to use for that is of a disorder averaged single particle Green's function. So I'm not going to go into too much of the technical details of this right now, but the point is that if we treat this defect state as a localized state, then we can have, and then we can average over disorder, we can end up with an average Green's function, which was first proposed in 2000. It has this relatively simple form, um, which just has our same parameters V and ED, and now there's a broadening that, is, that we can calculate. Um, inside. The bands are now no longer sharp. They're centered around the energies of the band anti-crossing model. But what we can do, and what, what I did with my postdoc, Hassan, is to calculate what is the weight of the states in each of these bands. So what you can see is that at k equals zero, there's a strong weight of this state. There's a full state down here at the bottom of the E minus band, but there is not actually very much state here. It's not that it's not filled, it's not about filling, it's about whether the state actually exists. Um, and as you move out to the higher K, the, the weight goes up into the E plus band and the E minus band, which has mostly defect carrier over character, uh, becomes uh, less strong. Okay, so with that, we can now talk about the plasmonic properties of this E minus band, if we have some filling inside from doping. So, um, we're going to calculate the plasma frequency by just taking the bulk plasma frequency formed from uh, with the simple definition of when the dielectric function uh, in the long wavelength limit, at what frequency does that dielectric function, the real part, go to zero? 
Okay, so we can calculate from our Green's function, this dielectric function, and we're gonna consider the case where we only have electrons inside of our E minus band. Okay, so when, I'm not gonna go through the details, but we end up with this dielectric function that has a famous form. So we get a standard form that looks like the response of just a one band metal with a response function chi minus. And we get another term that has to do with the interaction, the, 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 the uh, effect of this E plus band. This chi cross term serves to limit the plasma frequency. It can't get larger than the excitations up to the E plus band or else what we do is we uh, create particles up there. It limits our plasma frequency. Okay, so what we can see is we can take the, the um, experimentally determined band anti-crossing model parameters for this quaternary alloy, gallium arsenide phosphide nitride. Okay, which is relatively well studied. We can treat it where gallium arsenide phosphide is a standard alloy, and then nitrogen is the mismatched element that goes inside it. And you can see that if we consider doping it at 10 to the 18, uh, um, electrons per cubic centimeter, then we can end up with a prediction for our plasma frequency. The, the bottom line over here is where we have no phosphide. So this is the gallium arsenide nitride case. And we can end up with plasmons that are in this range around 100 milli electron volts and going down with wide tunability inside this space. Now, we also have a, a um, uh, the doping axis. So this is just for one doping that I've shown. If we were to increase the doping, then we shift where we get these. And actually I've moved the, the top of this axis is now going up to 180 milli electron volts. Um, this region in white and the low, for, and the low um, plasma frequencies right next to it are basically where at this point we have filled, this doping is high enough to fill the entire E minus band. Um, and so at that point we have no plasmon left because it's a completely filled band. So, so we'd be interested in this region, um, the, the plasma frequency has maximized where roughly your band is half filled. Okay, so there's also some interesting effects in these highly mismatched alloys. The plasma frequency does not take the standard form you might expect. We can take a low doping limit where this E minus band looks parabolic. We have an effective mass. It goes like one over A minus, which is that weight that I just presented a little while ago. The carrier concentration is proportional to that weight, which tells you how many states there are. And we expect to find in this limit the famous result that the plasma frequency is basically the square root of 4 pi n e squared over the effective mass, which with this scaling should be proportional to this, uh, this weight term, the spectral weight a minus. Um, in fact, we find that the plasma frequency is proportional to a minus to the, to the three halves. So there's an anomalous scaling there, which has to do with the fact that these states um, don't actually all exist in the same way as the band. That, that the fact that this A minus is not always one. And this is something that we can detect by keeping our, um, number, of, our, our number of electrons constant and changing our effective mass by changing the, the alloying of the state. So this, this anomalous plasma frequency um, should be detectable in that limit. Now, I just want to say briefly, we haven't published this yet, but um, we have optical signatures to be able to determine the band anti-crossing parameters, if we're going to all the trouble of doping this E minus band, we should be able to get optical absorption from E minus to E plus. Um, and that should actually have a very strong optical absorption peak that is narrow, um, which characterizes the direct uh, joint density. That's the one where you have K conserving processes. You should also have uh, indirect processes. So we have a joint density of states between the E minus and E plus bands where K is not conserved. The two of those together should give you a, uh, a collective um, absorption. We don't actually know how to weight those. So this figure is drawn with them weighted uh, sort of arbitrarily, but we expect the strongest matrix elements to be um, for the direct process. And so this is for two, two, six examples. This is zinc telluride oxide or cadmium telluride oxide, but we expect to have uh, sh sharply peaked patterns here that will be able to extract the band anti-crossing parameters that we need. So um, with that, I will just give a quick recap, which is that highly mismatched alloys give a highly tunable platform for plasmonic properties that are in the mid to far IR. Um, we're working with uh, some collaborators to start to measure these, to make these doped highly mismatched alloys, to go look for these plasma oscillations, which have not been previously observed. And while we're there, we'll go look for the optical absorption. Um, I'd like to thank the, the funders of this work and uh, also you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor Creech. We actually have time for maybe one short question if uh, any of the audience here do have a question. Yeah. 
if we don't have any immediate question, uh, I would also like to invite people to submit question in the chat, uh, in the chat of the Zoom, if you are in the Zoom room, uh, so that we can continue our program uh, without further delay. Um, so our next speaker is Dr. Raja Paksi from uh, University of Paradenia of uh, Sri Lanka. We can see your slide. Um, uh, his talk will be donor acceptor conductive polymers. Um, without further delay, um, please take it away. Yeah. Thank you very much for inviting me to do this presentation. And very good morning to you from Sri Lanka. So I'm going to talk on donor accepted IP electronic and electronic polymers and OV. Um, so I'm Raj Paksha, a senior professor of the Department of Chemistry in Institute of Peradeniya, Sri Lanka. And to give you an introduction to electronically conducting polymers, uh, there is a very interesting article um, in the 50th anniversary perspective of the ACS General Macromolecules. Uh, Chimothy M. Swig of Department of Chemistry, MIT, writes an editorial on conducting semiconducting conjugated polymers, a personal perspective on the past and future. This is the uh, article and where he elaborates on the evolutionary chain of electronic conducting polymers in a pictorial manner, and that is open access, so I can present it. And this is a very nice picture, uh, like sulfur nitride polymers were the beginning. Uh, then you have uh, like uh, conjugated uh, carbon polymers, like polyacetylene, uh, polyparaphenylene, violinine, like these polymers. And then you have heterocyclic polymers with uh, polythiophene, polypyrrol, polyfuran, and also uh, like, I mean, you may have this heterocyclic atom outside the aromatic uh, moiety like polyaniline. And then you have uh, the uh, full straight form that is donor accepted type of conducting polymer. So what is next? superconductivity, magneto-optics, and artificial masses like that. So donor accepted type molecules are the, like this is uh, first generation, second generation, third generation electronically conducting polymers. So the evol evolutionary chain of electronically conducting polymers, the evolutionary chain begins with the sulfur nitride polymer that has extended conjugation of its entire chain. That is an inorganic polymer. However, the carbon-based uh, uh, homoatomic electronically conducting polymers like polyacetylene, polyparaphenylene, violinase, polyacetylene take the place of first generation organic ECPs, which began in late 1970s and early 1980s. At the same time, the heteroatomic uh, EPCs like polypyrrole, polythiophene, polyfuran, polyaniline, poly, uh, uh, pedot were developed. Uh, the donor accepted DA type uh, electronic conductive polymers stand out as the third generation ECPs, which have properties strikingly different to their prototype um, uh, typical uh, predecessors. So let's discuss these properties now. Uh, so this is uh, sulfur nitride. The polymers are called polythiacyl. So uh, an electronic conductive gold or bronze colored polymer with metallic cluster. The first conductive inorganic polymer discovered and found to be a superconductor at very low temperatures below 0 0.2 C Kelvin, a fibrous solid described as lustrous golden on faces and dark uh, blue black depending on the orientation of the sample. The, uh, the material is air stable, uh, however, it's not very soluble at all. It's, not, it's highly insoluble in all solvents. So that is the structure of uh, uh, polysulfur nitride, and you can access these things, it's in the public domain. Uh, and then, uh, uh, if I uh, introduce to you these three Nobel Prize winners, electronic conductive organic polymers, a uh, Nobel Prize in chemistry 2000, uh, where they have found that plastic can indeed, under certain circumstances, uh, be made to behave very like a metal. Uh, an accidental discovery by uh, uh, these three, uh, Professor Alan J. Higa, Professor Alan J. McDermott, and Professor Hideki Shirakawa shared the Nobel Prize. Uh, 
uh, in chemistry, uh, year uh, 2000. This is popular lecture, Nobel Prize lecture gives you very good uh, sort of read for uh, the development of these uh, electronically conducting polymers. So how can plastics uh, become electronically conductive polymers? As you know, you need to have this extendedly conjugated chain. So this extendedly conjugated chain acts as a path for electrons to move. But path alone is insufficient. You need to have charge carriers, uh, which physicists call solitons, polarons, and bipolarons. Uh, solitons are extendedly conjugated uh, Free radical. Say, for example, instead of this double bond, if you have uh, two, uh, we can imagine this as electron P orbit here, electron P orbit like that. And uh, somehow, like you have just one electron, so that is a free radical. I show you. So this free radical is externally conjugated, which is called soliton. So, in, say, suppose we break this bond and give electron to here, and we remove that electron from there. So, you have plus charge. So, this extended conjugated dot plus is called positive polaron. And similarly, if you break this bond, you have uh, one electron here, one electron here, you add another electron to that. So, you get minus charge. So, extended conjugated dot minus is called uh, negative polaron. Two positive polarons, uh, when they come closer, to uh, two dots can combine, giving two pluses. That is called positive bipolaron. Similarly, negative bipolarons, which are extendedly conjugated dications and dianions. So, some examples for conducting organic polymers, say polyacetylene, uh, polyparaphenylene, and then you can have polyaniline type of things. It can be NH or NH2 and can be sulfur here as well. And you can have X in the uh, five-membered aromatic ring, uh, NH, pyrrol, and sulfur, uh, thiopine, like that. These are uh, simple organic uh, ex ex uh, conjugated organic polymers. So this is how this, uh, so when, when you have two polyacetylene chains, Say, imagine uh, with double bonds oriented in that way and the other chain double bond uh, oriented in this way. When these two uh, chains merge in the natural structure, you, you uh, invariably you get a, a free radical here. That is, that free radical is extended conjugate. You can, you can break this one dot dot here, two dots make a, a double bond, so dot comes there. Likewise, it can go alone all the chain. So that is a solid turn. So in the undoped uh, native state, polyacetylene has, this is transpolyacetylene, has some electronic conductivity, like 10 to the minus 4 Siemens per centimeter. That is due to this native or naturally occurring uh, uh, solitons. So but you can increase this conductivity by the process called doping. Um, you can deliberately oxidize or reduce, partially oxidize or reduce. In the doped state, you can increase conductivity, say, for example, transpolyacetylene undoped 10 to the minus 4 and doped 10 to the 3 to 10 to the 4, like 10 to the 8 times. Cis polyacetylene undoped 10 to the minus 7, doped 10 to the 3 to 10 to 4, that means at least 10 to the 10 times. Likewise, polypyrrole undoped 10 to the minus 10, you can have 10 to the 2 to 10 to the 3, that means like 10 to the 12 to 10 to the 13 enhancement in conductivity. So, this is where you have shown the, the uh, polythiopene uh, uh, with uh, uh, dot plus, so that is the positive polaron, this undocked state, uh, say uh, positive bipolaron, two pluses, and negative polaron, uh, dot minus, external conjugated, and negative bipolaron, two minuses, extendedly conjugated. So these polymers have issues of solubility. Uh, and we'll discuss solubility and morphology of conducting polymer. Although extended conjugation and partial doping increase the electronic conductivity, the polymers are highly insoluble in common solvents. So a large number of organic aromatic groups are present in the polymer. Molecules aggregate via pi phi stacking, making the material insoluble. So insolubility makes it difficult for material processing to make devices, obviously. Therefore, it is important to attach solubilizing groups like amphibolic groups, coordination groups, Hydrogen bonding groups can make the material soluble in polar solvents, whereas alkyl, alkyl groups uh, can make the material soluble in non-polar solvents. So, 
So now we should uh, go into the uh, DA type polymers, electronic conducting polymers with increased intrinsic conducting, native conducting. Although doping uh, electronic conducting polymers results in several orders of magnitude of increase in electronic conductivity, as we saw, the doped ECPs are associated with several drawbacks, such as high chemical reactivity. They, are, they, are, they have charges, so they are reactive. Material, therefore, the material and device instability and processing and performance variability and incompatibility with various substrates and electronic components. In this backdrop, it is of paramount importance to design ECPs with increased native electronic conductor. Mm -hmm. DA type polymers fulfill this requirement. So, donor accepted type of conductive polymers. So here, doping is not mandatory to design metallic or even uh, semi-metallic type of organic conducting polymers. So alternating open shell conducted polymers comprising alternating, say for example, these are a few examples I have taken, uh, cyclopenta dithiophene and thiodiazoloxoquinexalone units can achieve high electrical conductance up to 8.18 Siemens per centimeter in their native state. So you have you have this uh, donor accepted type of uh, monomer, donor coupled with the acceptor, whole thing you polymerize and you get conduct electrical uh, conducting polymer without doping. Do uh, because uh, I'll show you later, the there are other, uh, other examples also, the alternating cyclopenta dithiophene and thiodiazoquinexalene co polymers have demonstrated that the donor acceptor uh, promotes very narrow band gaps. Therefore, highly conducting, strong electronic correlations, high spin ground state, so uh, and uh, uh, and low range phi delocalization, thus giving rise to high electronic conductors in their native undoped state. So, some donor molecules. Donor molecules are molecules uh, which are electron rich, like thiophene. By thiophene is even more electron rich. Furan, where you have oxygen here. Bifuran, terburan. The thiopin, uh, at, say when you, additionally, you can increase the electron density of, of this uh, thiopin ring by attaching like uh, ethylene dioxy uh, part where two oxygens can donate electrons to this or propylene dioxy ones. So these are so donor molecules you see making DA type polymers often contain electron rich heteroatoms like sulfur where you have, um, you have, uh, you have uh, electron pair there. Uh, lone pair uh, such as sulfur, oxygen, and sp3 hybridized nitrogen. Yeah. Uh, so, popular donor uh, molecules contain thiophene or furan based uh, structures. So, uh, this is sp3 hybridized nitrogen, uh, see, nitrogen with single bonds, three single bonds. So, these are the molecules, uh, these are some of the molecules that can act as donor, uh, donors, electron donors. Examples for some acceptors. So acceptors should be electron deficient materials capable of accepting electrons. So acceptors have electron deficient aromatic rings or double bonds due to the presence of electron withdrawing atoms. For example, uh, for example, groups such as this P2 hybridized nit nitrogen with double bonds, like this in this compound, there are two nitrogens with double bonds. Or uh, like lactam groups, lactam gro uh, groups in cyclic amide groups. So this compound has cyclic amide group and cyano group. Like this compound, uh, tetracyanodiaconexaline has cyano groups. Cyano groups uh, are electron withdrawing groups. So when, uh, so the benzadiazole. This is a very uh, good example for an electronic acceptor. So thalamide, like we, I mean, you, you can have these compounds. Uh, Synthetic compounds, also you can extract these compounds from natural products. So donor accepted types of molecules means you have a donor part, uh, sorry, donor part, like say uh, thiopene, and then accept a part, something like this, uh, is capable of accepting electron deficient uh, part. So then you attach uh, these uh, donors uh, to accept uh, using chemical couplings, using coupling to Marta coupling like reaction. So you have donor accept a single moiety, which is your monomer. Uh, now, this uh, thiopene, you can polymerize electrochemically uh, in positive potentials, uh, making a uh, polymer of this. So that then you made donor accept a type of 
polymer, which is which has native electronic conductivity. So you can have different uh, types of acceptors, uh, very different type of acceptors, and then we can we can do computer simulations and match their band gaps and see whether donors can actually transfer electrons to acceptors. So there's partial electronic transfer in the molecule from donor to acceptor, making these charge carriers within the chain even without doping. So benzothiodiazine is one of the very common examples, common, uh, commonly used in dyes, red kind of dyes. So that is a very good acceptor. And diketopirol, uh, pyrrol, DPV, and this is BTD. So this is also a very good acceptor. And then isoindigo and indigo, these are acceptors. So thiopene, uh, bithiopene, uh, bifuran, uh, thiopene, furan, pedot, et cetera, uh, Terpuron are very good donors. So we can couple donor and acceptor and polymerize either chemically or electrochemically to get donor acceptor type of polymer. So what we had, uh, I'll show you a few examples now. So this is uh, this is where uh, we are going to synthesize uh, this thiopene coupled uh, acceptor. So we can buy this bromine, uh, this uh, molecule with uh, two bromines attached to that, the, available in all rates. And then this is what is called Suzuki coupling, and you can make this uh, monomer. And monomer, you can polymerize electrochemically, and then you can study, so BTD, this is BTD T2 with two thiopines attached to it. Similarly, you can, you can attach two furans attached to it, so BTD F2 we call it. And we can polymerize them to get homopolymers of these uh, monomers, and also we can co-polymerize in different molar ratio, say one to one molar ratio, one to two, two to three, whatever the ratio that you want. You can polymerize in that ratio. All what you have to do is dissolve this compound in acid nitrile or so, and then with background electrolyte, you use a platinum electrode or geo electrode, and then apply potential from say zero to one with respect to the column electrode. You will see in progressive cycle programs a progressive increase in current, and you will see the deposition of the polymer which is electronically conducting, that is why current is increasing. And then using AC impedance, you can measure this uh, electron transport uh, resistance. And uh, also this is uh, the, the, uh, the electron transport accompanies ionic motion. So I, um, the resistance for ionic motion also you can study. So, you, so we have done that for homopolymers and also for polymers of so different stoichiometries. And we found that uh, uh, these polymers uh, are conducting uh, almost entire range of the potentials, regardless of whether we have actually doped or not. Here, undoped state, also we have some conductivity. So, uh, what you can see is DA type polymers can be easily synthesized by electropolymerization. Uh, for example, uh, BTD is a good acceptor, and thiopene or furan is a good donor. The monomer T, BTD, T, we call it BTD T2 or BTD F2 can be easily synthesized chemically via Suzuki or Kumada coupling reaction. The monomers can be electropolymerized to get uh, the polymers T, BTD, T, N times or F, BTD, T, F, uh, N time polymer. We have also shown that the copolymers define the stoichiometry of monomers. So the interesting thing is now if you use a, like a one to one um, molar ratio of your monomers, the resulting polymer has one to one stoichiometry. If you have two to one, you have two to one stoichiometry, which you can easily determine from cyclotometry and uh, from uh, uh, Elemental analysis using uh, SCM or TEM. We have done all these things. Actually, we have published. Uh, we uh, I worked in collaboration with Dr. Davita L. Watkins of Mississippi University and my good colleagues uh, uh, Daniel Strong uh, uh, in Temple University, uh, USA. And we published this uh, in advances in, uh, in, in Journal of Materials Chemistry C in 2019. Uh, because I, uh, I was on my sabbatical at Mississippi University with Dr. Watkins group for six months. So during this period, actually I produced uh, six uh, at, uh, papers in like uh, highly indexed journals like Journal of Materials Chemistry C. So this is another example. Uh, again, uh, 
2020, you have this uh, uh, polymer, we can characterize. Interesting thing is they absorb and emit in the NIR region also. So we can calculate these band gaps and all these things. So um, due to limited time, I'm not going to talk about this, but you can find out uh, why to five star transition, polar band, bipolar bands, etc. And uh, you can tabulate all this and these are published. And thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Rajapaski. Uh, very nice talk. Um, uh, I wonder if the next speaker, Dr. Ten Xiaonie, is in this room. Because um, I don't think the speaker is here. Okay, so um, if, if, the, if Dr. Ten Xiaonie is not here, I think we will probably have to move on to the next talk uh, by Dr. Mei Yong Liao from uh, National Institute of Material Science, Japan. Dr. Liao, you're here, right? Yes, I'm here. Hello. Okay, okay. So uh, do you mind? Uh, I, okay, so I, I think you could start sharing screen. Um, Dr. Liao oh, is... Oh, yes, uh, hello. Yes. Dr. Liao is from National Institute of Material Science, Japan. He's going to tell us about semiconductor diamond electronics and uh, MEMS sensors. Uh, please go ahead, Dr. Liao. So, so should I, I have to share my screen? It, you, could, uh, you, can, you can talk in uh, live if you want, or if, or if you prefer us to play the video, we could also do that, the same thing. Uh, could you please play the video? So, because I, I don't have the uh, PVD in hand. Oh, okay. We could play the video. Okay, so um, I'll, I'll ask the co-host to, to play the video. You could stay here if, if there's any question. We could uh, communicate in the chat. So Jingyuan, can you play the uh, PowerPoint video of Dr. Liao? Okay. Uh, Thank let you. Me share. And again, for the attend, uh, attendants, uh, if you have questions, uh, you want to uh, discuss scientific topics, we could, uh, you're welcome to uh, type your questions, answers in the chat. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I'm Mei Yun Liao from Nimes, Japan. Firstly, I would like to thank the organizers to invite me to present our work. My today's talk is on semiconductor diamond electronics and MEMS sensors. In this talk, I will firstly make a brief introduction about diamond electronics and MEMS. Then I will report to you the diamond electronic device and diamond MEMS devices. Finally, I will summarize my today's talk. As you can see from this table, diamond holds the highest electronic properties for power electronics and the highest mechanical properties for MEMS devices. I would like to first tell you why diamond is suitable for energy saving, high power, high frequency electronic devices. As you can see, diamond has the highest figure of merit, for example, the Joseph figure of merit, which is around 5,800 times better than silicon. And also, it has the highest particle figure of merit and the high frequency figure merit, so it is suitable for the high power handling and also for the low and high frequency loss electronic devices. And also because diamond has the highest thermal conductivity, so we don't need to put any thermal sink for, for the heat dissipation. So you can see from the figure, diamond has the highest breaking down voltage and the lowest on resistance. So this is uh, very important to reduce the geo heating. For example, if we want to have 10 kilowatts spectrum voltage, so for diamond, we need only 20 micrometer, and for silicon, we need 1,000 micrometer. And also, it is also thinner than those of silicon carbide and carbon nitride. So from this viewpoint, so diamond is the best material for power electronic devices application. As for semiconductor applications, unfortunately, all the dopants in diamond are very deep. For example, the donor phosphorus has a thermal energy around 0.5 CVV 
and for the except the ball, the energy is around the point three seven UV. So it is difficult to use a diamond as a conventional semiconductor. But fortunately, diamond has a unique surface conductivity. When we expose an intrinsic diamond IP layer to air, a two-dimensional pearl glass with sheet density around 10 to 12 per centimeter square will be formed on the surface of a diamond. So we can use this surface conductivity for electronic devices. Actually, most of the device up to now is based on the surface conductivity of a diamond. By using the surface conductivity of a diamond, you can fabricate the conventional Mosafiti with high breakdown voltage and high thermal stability. But in most of the cases, the conventional Mosafiti based on hydrogen surface conductivity diamond always shows normal on behavior. Here, we propose and demonstrate a normal off diamond FET with a new device structure, which we call metal insulator metal semiconductor certified transistor. We firstly deposit a certificate on the diamond surface, then we put another oxide on the certificate so that we can debrid the diamond surface carrier because the certificate effect. The oxide on the shutter can reduce the leakage current, so this device structure combines the mass affinity and the more affinity merit with the normal of population and high forward current. Let's see the transistor properties of the diamond mim safety based on the hydrogen terminal surface conductivity. The gen current shows almost the same level as that of more safety, and it also has the features of mass safety with the normal off behavior with the minus threshold voltage. We also measure the high temperature properties on the diamond mean safety up to 350 degrees. As you can see, the joint current only slightly reduced up to 350 degrees, and the on-off ratio remained up to 10 to 6, even at high temperatures. The device still remained normal off behavior. The threshold voltage is still minus values even at high temperatures. One interesting thing is that the sub swing is close to the ideal value. At room temperature, the value is 76 millivolts per decades, close to the theoretic one around 60 millivolts per decades. And at high temperature, the value is even smaller than the theoretic ones. Possibly this is due to the Chops at the interface. Next, I would like to show you our work on diamond MEMS or NEMS. Most of you know diamond has the outstanding mechanical properties for MEMS or NEMS application. I will show you diamond also has other merit for MEMS application. For example, it has the highest quality factor or the lowest mechanical energy loss for MEMS, which is limited by the intrinsic materials properties, thermoelastic dissipation. The calculation shows that in the normal frequency range, diamond has the highest quality factor among all the semiconductors, and the quality factor is even better than quartz. Other features include, include the non-existence of oxide on diamond. As you know, or for silicon, silicon carbide, gallium nitride, there is always native oxide on the surface. Such kind of surface layer will induce the interface friction and also degrade the quality factor. 
Of course, diamond mems can be fabricated on silicon substrates. But in such a case, the diamond is always polyxtone nature or non-polyxtone nature. In our case, we aim to fabricate single crystal diamond mems so that we can achieve the extreme performance and the high reliability. We start from the single crystal diamond substrate, which is always high pressure, high temperature substrates. We use the smart cut method by using eye implantation technology to generate a graphite like layer in diamond. We can remove such kind of graphite layer, then we can erase structure for MEMS application. To improve the quality of the diamond MEMS, we always need to grow a home apex layer on diamond. By using the smart card method, we can easily fabricate the single cell diamond MEMS and MEMS with different dimensions from several tenths nanometer to micrometer, even millimeter size. We measured the resonance frequency of the single cell diamond MEMS and the MEMS cantilevers by using a laser doppler velocity meter. As you can see, the length dependent resonance frequency is consistent with that of theoretical prediction. From the resonance frequency, we can obtain the mass modulus of a single cell diamond, which is around 1,100 gigapascal. I would like to say our process for the MEMS of single cell diamond fabrication is highly reproducible. Because we use ion implantation in the fabrication, so the quality factor is usually degraded by the defects induced by the eye implantation. Then we remove such kind of defects by automatic scale etching in the oxygen ambient. So we call this automatic scale etching because we can control the speed very slow. For example, the etching rate can be as slow as 0.2 nanometer per hour. So at one time and nearing, we can finally improve the quality factor actually in our device. We are near the sample for around 400 hours. Even in such a case, we can see the candidate resonance frequency still follows theoretical prediction. By using atomic scale etching treatment, we can gradually improve the quality factor of the diamond cantilevers. As you can see, after 380 hours annealing, the quality factor was improved from several thousand to over 500,000. This is due to the removal of the defective layer at the bottom of the diamond cantilever. The removal of the defective layer is consistent with the TM observation. To further improve the quality factor, we anneal the diamond cantilever in the hydrogen plasma environment. After four hours treatment, you can see the cantilever quality factor was improved to be over one million. We compared the quality factor of our diamond resonators with other materials. As you can see, a room temperature diamond shows the highest quality factor of one million. Actually, another group in ETH also showed the quality factor of one million at room temperature. They use the diamond on insulate technology. They are simply sending the diamond plate into nanoscale or microscale signals. So, Diamond has a big advantage for high quality factor resonators. By using the single cell diamond MEMS cantilevers, we developed the MEMS magnetic sensor, which can be obliged at high temperatures up to 500 degrees. We deposit a magnetostructive 
FHA same film on the Ivan Cantilever because the FHA has a large magnetostructive coefficient and also a high Curie temperatures above 650 degrees. Celsius. Upon external magnetic field, the resonance frequency of the FEGA diamond candidate will experience a shift that can be either decrease or increase depending on the stress types. Let's take a look at the magnetic sensing behavior by using the single cell diamond MEMS cantilevers. We put the diamond cantilever in the vacuum chamber to reduce the air damping. We measured the resonance frequency of the cantilever by using the laser doppler optical readout technology. As you can see, at high temperatures, the resonance frequency will be reduced. This is simply due to the reduction of the small rest of the candelabra at high temperatures. Upon the external magnetic field, the resonance frequency at a certain temperature will also be reduced compared to that of the candelabra without magnetic field. You can see, as the temperature increases, the resonance frequency shift remains almost unchanged. And also you can see the resonance frequency shift is almost linear with the magnetic field applied. Of course, if we apply much higher magnetic field at Tesla, we may see some nonlinear behavior. But at this moment, unfortunately, in our case, we cannot apply much higher magnetic field. This FEGA diamond can never can be applied at 300 degrees. If we insert a buffer layer between diamond candelabra and the ion gallium, we can improve the temperature stability up to 500 degrees. And even we can also improve the sensitivity from several hertz per millitesla to several tens hertz per millitesla. And also you can see the sensitivity is even increased at high temperatures. Okay, let me summarize my talk. We developed a new type hydrogen terminated diamond MIMS FEG with normal off ablation and high forward current. And this MIMS FEG has controllable stretch voltage. We also developed the single cell diamond MEMS technology and showed the quality factor of 1 million. Finally, we demonstrate the magnetic sensing properties by using this diamond MEMS candelabras. The temperature is as high as 500 degrees. Thank you very much for your attention. Finally, let me use this chance to introduce our new journal, Functional Diamond which is published by Terras and Francis. This is a new open access journal without article processing charge fee. Thank you very much for your attention. Hello everyone, I'm May Yun Liao from... Okay, uh, thank you uh, Dr. Liao for sharing the presentation and for being here in such an early morning. Uh, do we have any question? Any quick question? Maybe I could ask one very quick question is that um, regarding the diamond material, what is the biggest, biggest challenge right now? It seems, seems like di diamond is such an amazing material, uh, such a promising uh, material. What's the challenge? Uh, what, yeah, what prevents uh, us from using it? I really actually, yeah, as, uh, as you know, is a nice material for mechanical as a traditional use. So actually the no people is uh, one is on the poor electronics. But unfortunately, uh, there's a problem with the large focal growth and uh, there is also anti doping problem. So this is still in progress. But if we can success, of course, we'll have a much smaller and much 
uh, energy saving device for the power electronics, for the, for example, for the high speed chain or the flight switching device so that we can save much more energy compared to silicon carbon and nitrate. But unfortunately, this stage, we have intrinsic, may all not, not, maybe not intrinsic, but very challenging for our decades. So this is one of the chance, and that chance the quantum sensing. So you know the color centers, uh, for example, the nitrogen vacancy or silicon vacancy in diamond. So that's a uh, unique, so we can, even, we can use it for the solid state quantum device, for example, for the high sensitivity uh, thermal sensor and also for the force sensor and any, any kind of, or in the, for the plane sensor. So now this is a very hot topic in the solid state physics. I think at this moment for the high technology application is the power electronics and uh, the quantum sen sensor and also of course one or another is a MEMS. So it also can be, has a high reliability and also the high sensitivity compared to other materials. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I wonder, so we sh we're supposed to have another talk here, uh, but I, I wonder if Dr. Doyan Chen is here. I don't, doesn't seem like, uh, based on name I see. Okay, if not, uh, I think this concludes this EPMM session this afternoon or whatever time you are at. Um, uh, I, I would like to thank all the speakers um, for, for contributing to this session. And uh, if you want to stay uh, for EPMM4, uh, this is, I think this is a Zoom link, you should stay. Uh, otherwise, um, thank you very everybody for, um, for attending this session. Um, Thank you, Professor, Thank you. For, for your host. Thank you, Professor. Thank you so much. See you, everyone. Have a Good great uh, afternoon, evening, or night, or morning. Thank you, Dr. Lee, for chairing this session. You've done a wonderful job, and uh, we shall have still time for the next session. So we will yep. take a break. Yeah, we will take a break. I will be speaking in the next session, actually. Yes. See you guys. Thank you for showing up. See you guys.